Hello, and welcome to Let's Study Half-Life 2, Part 5. Picking things up again for our coastline road trip. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about pacing. A crooked road, a road in which the foot feels acutely the stones beneath it, a road that turns back on itself. This is the road of art. That's a line that appears early on in Theory of Prose, a book by the Russian formalist literary theorist Viktor Shklovsky, and it's basically the thesis of the entire book. Again and again, Shklovsky makes the point that if writers just took the most direct route from the beginning of their story to the end, there would be no story whatsoever. So instead, they take circuitous paths. Sometimes this just means manipulating language, adding repetition and redundancy, at the basic level of word usage. You weren't too bored by Women on the Wall, an exploration of gender in text and media, Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer in conversation with Helen Molesworth? Are you kidding? I loved Women on the Wall, an exploration of gender in text and media, Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer in conversation with Helen Molesworth. Other times it means literally forcing their protagonists to take inefficient and circuitous paths. <laughs> The end result is what Shklovsky calls stepped construction. Here's a graph of what a theoretical story would look like if the protagonists coasted easily to their goal. There's really not anything here. So writer's main job is to add things that impede progress. Often this will be some sort of subtask that the hero needs to complete before they can reach their goal. You must return here with a shrubbery, or else you will never pass through this wood alive. So the hero moves forward toward their goal, is sidetracked by an obstacle until they complete a task that resolves it, moves forward a bit more, and so on. Oh, you want me to climb that, huh? No problemo! These sorts of impediments serve as delaying tactics. They exist to decelerate the pace of the story, to draw it out, to make it crooked. But what does that mean? Les pompes funèbres ont promis de passer, madame. Vous voyez, nous les attendons. Bien entendu, nous restons à votre service. Ah non, non, moi je m'en vais. Je ne veux pas manger ici. Mais pourquoi Enfin, Raphaël, vous n'y songez pas. Moi, ça m'est égal. Je peux vous assurer, messieurs, dames, que vous ferez un excellent dîner. Ah non, 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 moi je m'en vais. Bon, si vous voulez. In the early history of game studies, there were several scholars who read literary theorists like Shklovsky quite closely. And they did so because they wanted to argue that games and stories had irreducibly different structures. They didn't think that games should tell stories, and they didn't think that games storytelling was a valid topic for analysis. This academic debate raged on for a few years, which all seems a bit silly in retrospect. If anything, game stories are often perfect examples of this sort of step-by-step -step construction, with side obstacles nested into the primary drive forward. Take even just a cursory glance at a game like Dead Space, and you'll find that each of its chapters perfectly maps onto a new obstacle, some new mechanical failure that protagonist Isaac Clark needs to go fix before he can get on with his main goal of getting off the Ishimura alive. Pretty much every task the player undertakes in a game like Dead Space is getting past some new impediment, introduced as a delaying tactic. We're online and functional. Finally, some good news. Get a transfer to bridge, Isaac. I'm gonna take us back into a gym station. Wait, wait, we're not safe yet. Ship's asteroid defense system is offline. But if you lean on these sorts of transparent delaying tactics for too long, it begins to get tiresome. Together we can conquer, if not the world, and certainly Bill Williamson. But first, you need me to do you a favor? Ha <laughs> ha you read my mind. Many single player games struggle when it comes to balancing the pacing of fun player activities with the pacing of a satisfying story-based experience. Thinking about how much of my time you're wasting. <laughs> even if your gameplay is really fun, there's only so many times you can escalate things, throwing even bigger waves of dues to shoot at the player before you end up facing diminishing returns. And I don't think I'm alone in thinking that game developers struggle with game pacing. Achievement statistics show that even when it comes to heavily story-focused single-player games, less than 50% of players will actually reach a game's ending. And often that figure is close to 20% or under. So I can't be alone in considering the back half of far too many games to be a slog. Half-Life 2 isn't perfectly paced. I mean, it's no ghost trick Phantom Detective, which is perhaps the best paced game I've ever played.
Seriously, go play Ghost Trick Phantom Detective. It's an utter delight. But this road trip section is good, and it uses some tricks to vary up the pacing beyond the usual impediment-based delaying tactics. And this makes sense, I guess, when you think about it. If you look at the history of the road movie, forward motion toward the finish line tends to be broken up by more digressions and pit stops than clearly defined obstacles. What the hell is this? Troublemakers? You name it, I'll throw rocks at it, Sheriff. Well, don't look too close at her because the Sheriff's right over there, you know what I mean? Check that joker with the long hair. The history of that narrative form has given rise to much looser forms of pacing. Based more around exploring local color than encountering roadblocks. Figuratively or literally. The pacing of the Highway 17 sections of Half-Life 2 is largely defined by the environmental features of its level design. The various maps that make up this sequence all embrace what I like to call a stream pool design. I'm borrowing this term stream pool from environmental science. Yep, that's right. Despite its extreme simplicity, it is a bona fide technical term. It describes exactly what it sounds like it describes. Those deep, low current pools that collect at certain points along the path of a meandering stream or river. They're often positioned at bends, after riffles, were partially separated from the main path of the stream by sandbars. In applying this term to video game level design, I'm using it to describe geographic nooks in otherwise linear games, where players are encouraged to wander from the otherwise apparent path forward and explore some tangential features of a game's geography. In these coastline drive sections of the game, that will basically mean any time we get out of the dune buggy and explore roadside areas on foot. We'll do that a lot over the course of these road trip levels. Sometimes we're forced to get out of the buggy, due to some actual roadblock or obstruction. There are moments along the drive where Valve has unavoidable combat encounters planned, where we'll have to switch from driving to first-person shooting and then back to driving after we throw a switch somewhere. But there are plenty of other areas that are entirely optional. We might just stop and see what sort of goodies a house has because we're low on health or suit energy. Remember back in episode 3 the points I made about health packs as a motivation for player exploration. It isn't always immediately clear which areas are required stops and which are optional stops. So players are encouraged throughout these levels to take a slow and exploratory pace. To give a sense of how this works in practice, I'm going to take a close look at two specific maps, D2 Coast 05 and D2 Coast 09, and then the bridge section, which takes place over several maps. So first, a map called D2 Coast 05. Like every map in Half-Life 2, it's a linear experience, made especially obvious here by the fact that we're following a road. But along the various bends and twists in the road, you'll see these moments when players are encouraged to slow down. This might be something as simple as some roller mines getting in our way, forcing us to get out of the buggy to remove them. And then we might find some derelict cars which need punted out of the way. Or a landslide that we can easily drive over, but will cause us to slow down a bit. Up ahead on the same map, we see a more elaborate stream pool. Combine soldiers have set a trap for us, collapsing some debris onto the road. In actuality, this little impromptu roadblock doesn't cover the entire road. We could easily speed past it if we felt so inclined. But people are shooting at us, and we're losing health, 
So we're indirectly encouraged to get out of the buggy here, and take on these enemies on foot. That way, at least, if there are health items inside these buildings, we can grab them, so this encounter might actually be a net gain for us. And indeed, this pays off. There are goodies in these buildings once we scour them. Around the bend, another small encounter, some more derelict cars, and another landslide. This time with some guys shooting at us as well. This graveyard of ruined vehicles marks the beginning of an area that invites several approaches. We can, if we want, punt the cars and bars out of the way, and drive through. But if we do that, we'll eventually encounter a force field up ahead on the bridge, and we can't go around it. Even if we get out of the buggy and punt it, there's still no way to slip through the crack here. So the best way to deal with this area is actually to use the makeshift crossbow, which we can find right up on this grassy knoll here. With it, we can snipe some of the soldiers before we get in close. And what we'll eventually want to do once we're over here and have gotten rid of all the hostile soldiers is remove the wheel jams that are parking this armored vehicle. It's powering the force field, and once we allow it to roll backwards into the sea, that will open the way forward. And of course, there's loot in these buildings, so we can further explore and scavenge. These little pauses don't make the coastline of Half-Life 2 any less linear. We're still barreling down a single road toward our single destination. But they give the player a decent amount of control over the pacing of the experience. We can drive forward, trying to avoid combat as much as possible if we just want to get things over and done with. But we can also get out of the buggy at every opportunity, pursue every enemy on foot, take our time to visit each and every one of these little roadside attractions, search every building to see what they have in store for us. For another close look at an individual map, here's D2 Coast 09. This one has a pretty subdued start. First, there's just a crashed truck with some boxes piled around. This isn't much of an obstacle, but it serves its purpose, which is just to slow us down. And then once we're already slowed down, we see this farmhouse on the horizon. And there's several things about it that can catch our attention. For one, there's smoke rising above it, and secondly, it actually has its own music cue. This farmhouse is my favorite bit of the Half-Life 2 coastline section, because it's actually entirely optional. When we looked at D2 Coast 05, we talked about the ways in which one might minimize roadblocks and combat encounters by not getting out of the car. But nothing in D2 Coast 05, or any of the other coastline maps, goes quite as far as this farmhouse. It's not a roadblock at all. It's just purely an invitation to explore, nothing more. From the perspective of Valve's level designers, this distinction between forced combat roadblocks and optional areas to explore is pertinent and obvious. But it's important to note that they bleed together more from the perspective of a player. The first time you take your road trip down Highway 17 as a player, you'll rarely be entirely sure whether getting out of the vehicle to explore a given cluster of buildings will prove necessary or not. Roadblocks and ambushes are often well hidden enough that they can take players by surprise, so it quickly becomes a learned behavior to get out of one's vehicle whenever one sees a building around, and approach trepidatiously, looking for supplies, enemies, and maybe a lever to defuse an as-yet-unseen trap. This subtly encourages a stop-and-smell-the-roses approach to these chapters of the game, modulating player behavior so as to modulate the pace of game events. And here, we're treated to some light environmental storytelling, and a fun jump scare.
Moving forward just a little bit, we find another combat encounter. We can hear gunfire as we approach this checkpoint, which gives us a heads up that it is manned and hostile. We might think that we can run right through it, but as we approach this roadblock lifts up, stymieing this attempt. Looks like it's time to get out of the buggy and shoot again. A fun little detail about this checkpoint is that it actually is possible just to run through it. You just have to know what you're doing. Just another little way that players can modulate the pace of this coastline road trip. You can't run through the next checkpoint. There's a small puzzle here where you need to collect three car batteries to raise a garage door that's blocking the way. This takes some peace and quiet to do, so you'll have to clear out the enemies here first. Overall, D2 Coast 09 gives us a really good look into how stream pools, be they created through inescapable combat and puzzles, completely optional side areas, or something in between, can work to break up the otherwise unrelenting flow forward of a linear game such as Half-Life 2. Just to add one final example of Valve's craft, I wanted to narrate a short personal story of my first time playing Half-Life 2, years and years ago. I'd parked my buggy in this cluster of buildings and started scavenging for some supplies. The sound of the headcrab zombie led me to seek it out and to kill it. And as I was chasing down the remainder of the poison headcrabs, just because you always want to make sure that these never sneak up on you, I noticed this little door on the side of the cliff, standing out, lonely, with a light above it. And lo and behold, it opens. And there are supplies inside, drawing me in. And then it just keeps going. Now it was in the inner workings of a bridge, and it just stretched on and on. The occasional headcrab encounter let me know that this is all planned. But otherwise, as I crept along these support struts, it felt as if I was breaking the game. But like, in a good way? I felt clever, as if I was exploring parts of the map that maybe shouldn't be open to me yet. And yet details here and there reveal that this was, in fact, an intended path. Like the fact that I was shooting a bunch of guys. And then I pull this plug over here and push this button, and even though I didn't realize it at the time when I first played the sequence, I had just removed an obstacle from my way. But I wasn't led over here by a need to remove an obstacle. I was led over here by my own curiosity, and by the exploratory, scrounging mindset that the stream pool design of the coastline section had foisted upon me. As I mentioned back in the push versus pull episode, Valve allows players to happen upon a solution to their puzzles without even fully realizing the problem. Another game might drown players in updates and new instructions if they break the designer's intended sequence of events, even accidentally. The Valve just lets us stumble upon things in silence. They cultivate an exploratory mindset by including all these stops by the side of the road, and then they have the confidence that this exploratory mindset will lead us in the right direction when we get stuck along the path. And really, I had no idea what I was doing in this section. I just kind of stumbled into a boss fight. But it all worked out in the end because the level was well-designed enough to allow me to explore my way out of my own predicament. And to be clear, the obstacle that I didn't initially notice is in fact well communicated. If I had driven the buggy up to the bridge in the first place, I would have encountered this force field and realized that the way was blocked. And then I could have visually traced these wires to see that they continue along the bridge, Putting two and two together based on past experience, I would have known to go seek out their source so that I could unplug them. 
but I didn't have to go through that exact sequence of events. The game also supports pure, exploratory curiosity as a player approach. As I've said before, it is subtly redundant in the cues it uses to direct us, allowing different players to stumble upon things via different mechanisms. This linear path but with nooks design strategy of stream pools is a really popular one these days. Valve used it again in Half-Life 2 Episode 2, large portions of which are just an extension of the road trip type style of the Highway 17 sections. Look, it's one of those advisor pods. Back in the Citadel, those things we saw. There, too, you see plenty of geographical nooks that players might initially stop at seemingly of their own volition, because they want to explore or pick up some supplies or something. Uh, what? What was that? There it is again. There's an advisor around here someplace. But it then later revealed to be essential parts of the game's storytelling, required stops on its journey. I've emphasized a couple of times now that this sort of pacing and exploratory play really depends on players needing something, such as health items. So it's no surprise then that linear games that have a strong survival aspect make use of this form frequently. Anytime a linear game adds something like a hunger mechanic, or some sort of crafting, or anything else that might encourage players into a scavenging mindset, you see the stream pool's design. It's become kind of the official style of post-apocalyptic games, actually. Showing up in things like the Metro series, The Last of Us, Shit, you're gonna go in there? I wanna see what we can find. You're gonna find my body when I die from a heart attack. Don't worry. I got this. And then even more experimental games like 35mm, which has very little first-person shooting involved, is mostly just a meditation on wandering, survival, and scavenging. All of these games are strictly linear experiences, much like Half-Life 2. But they all cultivate cautious and sharply observant players. And in this way, they're able to slow down their pace without throwing an endless stream of manufactured obstacles at their players. What well, next in the parade of constant Made obstacles? It. We're picking up radio chatter. They're looking for your car. Get your car in the garage. All right, that's all for this particular video, and we're going to have a lot to cover in the next one. So that one will be kind of a whirlwind tour. As always, thanks for watching.